everyone. Welcome to Battle of the Pitch Decks. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Tessa Bellsfield from Viatech, and I just want to welcome everyone for coming. Um, we, uh, before I continue, I'd like to acknowledge uh, this is the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people in Vancouver. I'm in Victoria, but I want to give a shout out to the people over there. Uh, we acknowledge with respect these people whose relationship with this land continues to this day, and we're all grateful to live, work, and play on this unceded territory. So last fall, Capital Investment Network, Viatech, Women's Equity Lab, and Syndicates held the very first battle of pitch techs, and it's now grown into a multi-city battle with the Angel Forum, Start Yukon, and Accelerate Okanagan joining forces. So today you're gonna hear from companies in Vancouver, and on March 31st, it's Whitehorse. April 21st is Victoria. May 5th, Okanagan. And on June 2nd, all those winning companies will face off for the grand finale. And uh, you can register for all these events right now on Eventbrite. That's in the chat. And uh, we hope you can make it to all, all four of these. Now, just before we get started, um, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, just a reminder that this is a webinar and all attendees are muted and unseen. Feel free to use the chat box at the bottom to engage with people throughout the event. Uh, just make sure the note goes to panelists and attendees and not just panelists. Uh, following each presentation, our judges will have the opportunity to ask questions. Feel free to use the Q&A box to ask further questions and the startups will try and reply via text. Uh, today's winner will uh, be decided following a brief deliberation at the end as we tally up all the points. Uh, so that there will be time at the very end to ask audience questions as well. So now I'd like to introduce you over to Irene Dorsman from the Angel Forum to say a few more words. Over to you, Ty Irene. Thank you very much, Tessa. Welcome everyone here. I think uh, we're off to a good start. I'm here to make sure that at least someone has an accent. So here we are. It's epic, isn't it, Jordan? Um, so a big, big thank you because we are Vancouver. Uh, I really would like to um, to really acknowledge the sponsors of Angel Forum Vancouver. Without them, we wouldn't be able to do all the things that we do. And that's in no particular order. That's Harper Gray, OKR Financial, PwC, Virtual CFO, Nimbus Synergies, and last but not least, T TSX Ventures. So a big thank you to them. And an even bigger, bigger thank you to the judges that have uh, kindly agreed to join us here. We try to, to make it as, uh, as mixed as possible from all the organizations that are involved. So it's my absolute pleasure to introduce the following people to you. First, there's Erin, Erin Alexander. She is uh, part of, uh, of our Well Group, and uh, I'm very pleased to see you here, Erin. I'm, I'm sure you will enjoy it, and you probably will be one of the best judges. So there we go. There's Steve Konishita, and I'm really happy about um, you being here as well, Steve. You're joining us from Whitehorse. So we will join you in a couple of weeks time. So thanks for being here. You have Carolyn Shaver, who is um, um, representing, uh, representing, sorry, Accelerate Okanagan and Gio Fell, who kindly last minute hopped in because Peter couldn't make it. So here he is, Robert Bennett, Viatech and Steph Andrew. So there we go. So I think we're ready to start with the first pitch. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce to you Stable. Um, they are here with, uh, with Jordan and Clarence. The Stable is the only online marketplace for small, medium businesses to find, manage, and pay freelance sales pros on demand. So there we go. Over to you, Tessa. Hi, my name is Jordan Lewis, and I'm the co-founder and CEO at Stable, a future work marketplace where SMB selling B2B can build amazing sales teams on demand. At Stable, we believe strongly that the process of hiring and managing a sales team is fundamentally broken. The process is risky, slow, and expensive, and freelance platforms like Fiverr and Upwork offer businesses access to fractional talent on demand, but not, does not work for sales. Why? Because sales is a process, not a project. When a business first signs up with Stable, they set their target by defining the ideal customer, they pre-purchase and add credits to their account, and from there, Stable handles the rest. Sale pros are matched based on their experience in the business's targeted domain. Scheduling is fully dynamic and automated based on predefined call windows and freelancer availability. 
Activity and performance is tracked and reported in near real time and sales pros are ranked and prioritized based on their performance. So why now? Current estimates state that at least 34% of the workforce is freelance currently. With COVID, many of the best sales pros are either unemployed or underemployed. We're treating this like an arms race. In California, things like Prop 22 have forced companies to adopt freelance and eliminate salaried positions. Fiber's acquisition of Work Not Work shows that there is a lot of interest in acquisition of select freelance sub-verticals. Currently, no platform has solved freelance for sales. We think we can be that platform. So how big is this opportunity? It's massive. Even if we just look at LinkedIn, you have 80 million salespeople globally with 27 million in Canada and the US alone. If we assume 34% of the workforce is freelance, you quickly see how big this opportunity is. Globally, our total addressable market is 27 million sales jobs. If we look at our serviceable market as a whole, there are approximately 9 million sales jobs in Canada and the US. If we even obtain 0.5 of a percentage point, that would give us 46,000 freelance sales jobs on stable. This is a massive opportunity. Our business model is simple. We take 40% of all sales contracts with 46,000 jobs or 0.5% market share and an LTV of $20,000 per contract over three years, we would generate just shy of $1 billion in revenue. A number given the fact we're currently only averaging 20 hours per month per contract is very large. This is a massive, massive opportunity. So how does the product work? At Stable, we treat sales professionals just like athletes. We leverage a proprietary system called Jasper to match sales pros with businesses, automate scheduling and manage payouts, and analyze activity to produce what we call a PAR score a representation of the user's performance, activity, and reliability. So we bootstrapped and launched in Vancouver, Canada. We treat GMV, and that's our North Star. We treat that as all sales contracts negotiated and pre-purchased and prepaid for on the platform. In the last 12 months, we've generated $744,000 in GMV, and if you look at the last 15 months, we've generated 785,000. This is growing at 61% quarter over quarter. If you look at revenue, which we look at as GMV times our take rate, 40%, we've generated an annual run rate of approximately $408,000 and a monthly recurring revenue of approximately $34,000. And this has been growing 91% quarter over quarter. So how do we acquire businesses? Simple, we eat our own dog food. We have a predictable sales process, a short sales cycle of approximately 30 days, and a high close rate. 40% of all demos typically close with our highest month seeing 64% close rate. If you ask me how we get a customer, I tell you it takes us 120 dials. How do we source sales pros? Well, all sales pros are on LinkedIn. It makes sourcing the right talent fairly easy. We run targeted outreach and it takes us approximately 56 messages to get one sale pro on the platform. This process is highly scalable, but we're focused currently on acquiring supply side talent for zero dollars. Our competition falls into one of four categories. You have traditional freelance platforms like Fiverr, Upwork and Freelancer.com, all of whom fail to support the sales process. You have outsourced offshore and onshore agencies sometimes call centers, and those are great, but they don't always work for B2B selling, especially offshore, and they can be quite expensive. And then if you're really feeling lucky, you can do it yourself. You can jump on Craigslist or Indeed and post a sales job, and just look at the type of applications you get. It's a really painful process, has high turnover, and it's quite expensive. Our team is lean, but extremely effective. Clarence and I have known each other for 25 years and have worked together at other startups. As mentioned before, we eat our own dog food, leveraging freelance sales pros off stable to do our outreach and LinkedIn we've leveraged to source both our engineering and product talent. Our advisory group have been operators and or board members at some of Canada's fastest growing tech companies like Unbounced, Dooley, Financia and Zazoom, raising or investing millions of dollars into these startups to help them grow and scale. 
So we're currently raising our seed and we're trying to generate $2.5 million. This will give us about 18 months to focus head down on building product and scaling and six months to focus on raising our Series A. Approximately 50% of our raise will be used to acquire 2,200 businesses and 6,300 sale pros throughout Canada and the US. Given our current traction and modeling, this will get us to approximately $400,000 MRR. The remaining funds will be used to increase the scalability of the platform and to make key hires to make sure we're successful in doing just that. If you're interested in learning more about how we plan to democratize the world of sales, we'd love to chat. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jordan, Jordan and Clarence. Um, really good. So I'm going to introduce you to Jordan Slee from uh, Sin and Syndicates from, uh, from Victoria. He's going to ask a few questions and ask the judging panel to forward their questions. There you go, Jordan. Yeah, yeah thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Um, just one question I kind of asked um, just the startups over the past kind of year. How, how has the pandemic helped or has it has it has it has it had some opportunity or some pains to kind of shift your market or is it have you seen an uptake on in this kind of in the space? Yeah, it's been interesting. So COVID's been a little bit of a double-edged sword for us. Uh, in one instance, it eliminated our biggest value prop, work from home. Um, mm -hmm. We quickly discovered that flexibility and being able to work with different companies was actually a stronger value prop. So cool. Um, but what it has done is it, it's accelerated acquisition of businesses. I think a lot of businesses because of COVID are looking for fractional talent that they can leverage as needed working from home. So we've seen this shift and it's been actually really positive. So we've had our biggest months off of the backside of COVID. Um, so for us, it, it's it's been a good thing. Awesome. Uh, and you're currently raising right now. What, what, what's your current um, round at? Um, are you just or started raising just currently? Yeah, we just started gearing up for our raise. We have about 20% soft committed and uh, we're hunting for a lead. That, that's our oh. focus right now. Awesome. Uh, questions from uh, the judges at all? Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, so one question I have is uh, regarding onboarding. Um, so with a lot of these products, there's a lot of uh, education that's required. How is the onboarding process for sales folks um, brought into this, you know, into your platform? Yeah, so it's a, it's a pretty tight onboarding process. Every client that signs up to the platform, they go through basically, uh, we do a deep dive, right? So build out their talk tracks, their target market, help them build out their prospect list. From there, um, we onboard and train every rep on that, on that uh, campaign that's running. Um, and then we do a lot to kind of manage and monitor their activity. What's really fortunate for us, for us is we focused on like the SDR BDR role. So we've really constrained the marketplace and being able to book a meeting, you don't have to have like total in-depth depth knowledge of that product or service that you're trying to book the meeting for. Um, so that side's been light, but yeah, we do a lot up front. A lot of it's collaborative with the client. They can actually engage the reps through the platform, through shared documents, and it's it's a collaborative process. So um, yeah, that's typically how we get uh, campaigns up and running. Can I ask a question just as a follow-up to that? Given that there's maybe a fair amount of um, labor or knowledge that you have to understand about each customer before you start to build a sales team, although you've minimized it with your focus, um, is there a upfront fee that you charge as well as the subscription fee to account for that? Yeah, we do. So um, we typically charge a $2,000 fee. Um, once COVID hit, we actually use as an opportunity to waive the fee to kind of get businesses on the platform. We look at it as an investment into their campaign and we're happy doing it and it's worked for us thus far. But yeah, there is typically a fee, um, but a lot of clients on the platform, um, if we believe in it, we waive it and it's just kind of, it's worked for us so far. And are you trying to build uh, customers in a certain field to help use, reuse, I guess, expertise that you're building over time? Like, I don't know, biotech or e-commerce where do you try and find your customers it's a 
Yeah, it's a good question. Um, our our customers, um, they fall. It's a mixed bag. It, you know, um, twenty five percent of our customers are SaaS companies. It seems to be like the go to strategy for most software companies. You've got the hunters teeing up the demos, but we've had a lot of success with agencies where we're teeing up discovery calls, construction companies where we're teeing up estimates, and we've recently started working with um, like OEMs. Uh, companies that manufacture really cool product, they're trying to get into reseller distribution channels or keying up quotes and orders, but the workflow remains the same. It's, you know, we're the warm introduction, establishing they've got a need um, and then handing them off. So uh, the exciting part of this is like, what, what qualifies as a great customer for us is simple. They've got a product or service, they're selling it B2B, they've got a target group of business that they like to go after and they want to incorporate a high volume of highly personalized engagement that's where you need a human and not a, not a robot. Yeah. I think there's time for one more question. And I think Erin, you dropped a question. Yeah, in the, I just uh, had a quick question in regards to your sales um, contract individuals that you um, brought on. So um, I guess, how many do you have and what's your retention, um, you know, to get someone good on board? Do you find that they're staying with you and, and you know, going to multiple customers or are they coming and going in, in that regards? Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're, we're lucky once we like place a rep and start feeding them, it's rare that they leave. Um, yeah. we do, right, we do have people that are like kind of hunting for full-time gigs and they're using this as just a way to kind of in the meantime, generate uh, revenue on the side. But yeah, so far we've been very fortunate. All the reps on the platform, we have about 250 active reps on the platform currently. Um, once we feed them, they stay. Um, they like the flexibility. They like to work with different companies, different industries, and set their own schedule. So it's kind of the dream job. And one thing we've really focused on is uh, putting more money in their pocket than they could earn working full time. So spend less time uh, on stable, but make more money, uh, whether that's through bounties, hourly rate, et cetera, fully negotiable on the platform. So uh, yeah, our retention rate uh, when it comes to sale pros is really good. Good. Thank you. I'm just last question, Jordan. Um, there's a bunch of questions coming in now. Uh, we got to uh, move to the next one, but is there a best email that um, people can reach out to uh, direct? Um, do you want to just put in the chat um, and they can email you uh, direct if they have any questions? For sure. Sounds good. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much, Jordan and Clarence. That was great. You will always be known as the company that kicked off the sort of the larger version of the Battle of the Pitch decks. Well done. Um, <laughs> we're going to move to uh, we're going to move to our second company, and uh, that company is called Spindle. We have uh, Jackie Evanescence here and and Chris Seto. So I'm very happy to see you again. Um, thanks for being here. Um, that's all I'm going to say right now. It's a, it's a platform. Spindle is in the K-12 project platform where students become sort of the just-in-time community to bounce ideas off, get feedback, and better manage on their own. And these ladies know everything what they're talking about because they have been in the classroom and have dealt with all the uh, problems that they actually are addressing. So please take it away. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Evanez. I am one of the co-founders of Spindle, a just-in-time class community for student-led projects. My co-founder, Christine and I, we were teachers of seven years. We taught the gamut, everything from grade one to grade 12. And we liked doing personalized projects because it kept our students engaged. And more and more schools are turning to this style of learning. But we couldn't keep up with this process okay you have 25 students that are working on 25 different projects we needed a system to monitor all of these pieces so that we could better mentor them but all we had access to were these assembly line model of software where the workflow bottlenecked at us so we left teaching and we created spindle spindle is a just-in-time class community for projects students can check in with each other every step of the way and when spindle redirects the workflow in the classroom to peers kids now have a place to share ideas their drafts their iterations and they're getting feedback that they need when they need it and teachers can see all of the pieces woven together on one dashboard so that they can quickly orient themselves to where each student is at through our pilot studies in nine schools and two teacher training programs, 
Teachers have shown that they're spending less time planning and doing inventory. They're spending less time tracking down their student work and they're spending that time actually helping their students. And that's because Spindle has increased and organized documented work. Um, and students are getting this instant feedback and planning time is significantly reduced for teachers. Spindle's check-in system has also elevated the quality of education for students. It helps them keep on track and now they're able to move forward more independently. Schools are looking for ways to embed social emotional learning and this executive functioning skills into the curriculum. Spindle is it. The majority of our students um, felt more confident taking on these projects on their own. Uh, teachers are also looking to Spindle because it's, it's one place to look. They no longer have to dive into several platforms to track down student work. They just go to Spindle. Um, it plays nice with other platforms. We've already interoperated with Google Classroom and Office 365, and we're looking to um, connect with more reporting and creation tools for students. And we're selling into the K-12 US market. It's quicker to adopt and it's larger. And specifically, we compete in the engagement, social collaboration and competency-based learning spaces. That makes our address addressable market anywhere from 800 million to 1.15 billion. Uh, the competency-based market is newly emerging, but it is growing fast. And we've spent the last year building credibility with a spindle community of believers through our pilots and teacher trials. Um, we have actually almost reached 100 teachers as we were developing the product. So now we're selling. We plan to have slower sales uh, this year as we continue to develop our product and build credibility. Um, but we do expect to see greater returns next year when we interoperate more seamlessly with larger LMSs. We do believe we can hit 10 million in revenue by year five as the only product to streamline assessment for modern learning. So how do we get there? Um, teachers have been trained to self-select products that meet their needs. Often they will pay out a pot, uh, pocket for something that will support them. With enough prodding from their staff, principals have no problem purchasing software if they know that their teachers want it. And most principals have a discretionary budget to work with. They can spend up to $5,000 on one product. Um, and this bottom-up approach is super common in ed tech. Um, the mechanics also work the same at the district level. So saying that, we will target teachers year one with a free trial and organic social media campaigns. We're also building a loyalty program. So um, if, if teachers are gonna help tell our story, then they will get a discounted rate. And in phase two, we will be targeting schools and this sales cycle is seasonal. So we will focus on school sales in the summer and fall. Uh, but with teachers as our champions, we are confident that schools and districts will purchase knowing that their key stakeholders are already on board. So looking long term, we foresee three potential exits through acquisition. Two are larger education software companies and the others are ecosystems like Microsoft and Google. And they have just recently both purchased a social or a project-based learning platform. This is our team. And right now, uh, this is the right team to help us build our customer funnel. Gag and Deep is one of our developers. He has experience leading two other successful startup teams. Chris and I are teachers, we speak the language, we've lived the problem, we are our customers. And we have an advisory team out of Boston that is from the ed tech accelerator space. So they have a lot of a wealth of knowledge in the industry. But most important to us, we have 25 teacher advisors on board that help us with the design and the promotion of the product on a daily basis. So we are looking to raise 400K on a convertible note with a cap of 2.7 million. Um, a developer and a customer success manager are our next key hires. It's really important to us that we improve our onboarding and um, user retention and support is focused on. And if investment allows, we will be looking for a developer um, as well as another sales. And this is to interoperate um, 
with larger LMSs so we can start looking to sell to schools and districts. So thank you for your time. Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Uh, question with um, just with the pandemic, um, do you see this kind of trending upwards as people can get back into it? Or do you think this will be just a, a more of a pivot uh, to see how we're, we've kind of done the last year on, on this um, LMS kind of educational side? So what we've seen from teachers is the need for a platform like this has definitely been um, highlighted for teachers. So they have adopted it much more quickly, but on an institutional level, there's a lot more stress um, coming at schools because they have to basically reorganize their systems outside of the tech world um, as well as with the tech world. And so falling back on a platform that's been around for 10, 15 years is much easier than, you know, um, going for us, who is who we were just in the piloting phases last year. Um, but in terms of opportunity for schools long term, yes, there's like a much greater um, opportunity because of COVID, because now schools are turning to projects for engagement for their students. And they also need to rethink attendance. Okay, so like, what is the what counts as learning what is this daily effort and engagement well it's the evidence of learning that students need to show and so schools are realizing that now um, and a product like this that highlights process that no other product does um, is going to i think going to be such a um a big piece down the road and you said you had some um some people on on the platform already um is is that the current or is it business churn or is there is there you know once they sign up they stay or has there been some drop off well we i we have just been at it for the one year so uh we have our reoccurring customer our pilot customers from last year they i think it's 96 percent have stayed on with us um and all of our schools have stayed on with us so um, but but yes, we've only been in a piloting phase. We have no reoccurring revenue yet. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, a question came in, um, are you going after the public or private schools or, or I guess both, I guess, whoever? Um, interestingly enough, most of our schools have been public and they have been in the States. I think they're just quicker to adopt something that's um, new. It's a different way of looking at the workflow in the classroom. Uh, and so that's where we have focused is in the US, mostly the East Coast states. And um, we will start looking at the private schools here once we've um, once we've like fleshed out that use case story and we have some like much more credibility to show private schools are they're looking for they will adopt, but they are looking for something that is more established. So we'll probably give it another six months or so before we reach out there. Okay. Judges, any any questions? Um, I have a question. Do you know which um, budget for schools or school districts that you fall under for this? For the, Go ahead, Christina. Uh, the line item, it usually falls under um, anything related to curriculum and instruction. So technology is a very broad um, category that usually deals with your more hardware pieces. So the technology or the curriculum and instruction line items, social emotional learning is another one we fit under. Um, so it's any sort of or um, anything related to their standards. So standards based learning, competency based learning. Um, again, all of that falls kind of under that uh, curriculum and instruction item. Are you attempting to be registered then under their curriculums or? Attempting to be in in their curriculum, sorry. Like usually if you be, like there's a process to become registered so that it goes under that line item for curriculum or is that something you're working on or not as of yet it hasn't come up okay. yeah i just have a question in regards to um how it works so what would you say is the the best part of a spindle compared to say like i know i have kids and they use ms teams now and they can upload and the teacher can chat back and forth what would you say if you had like a quick one spindles great because <laughs> it depends who's talking honestly if okay. it's the teacher talking or the student talking so okay. if it's if it's the teacher talking, Spindle's great because I just easily check in. I get to do my job as a mentor and not as, you know, inventory 24 seven. 
Um, and if it's the student talking, it's I, I get unstuck. Okay, so the communication between the two, is that? Not even the communication. So we've had a lot of success with, um, especially with truancy. So students who are, you know, highly absent or especially in these in hybrid or remote settings, they're not as um, engaged, let's say. And teachers have found that, you know, you put a student on Google Classroom and they've got a bombardment list of like, these are all the things you missed over the last week. And kids don't know, they don't, have, it's the executive functioning piece. I don't know where to get started. I don't know which task to start first. I don't know which one's going to take the most time. I don't know what to prioritize. But you put a kid on Spindle, they click into a project and they're literally like, this is your first step. And so we had a lot of our, and this is high school students, grades 10 to 12, who were um, typically truant. A lot of the teachers reported that they would finish their projects on Spindle before they would do any other work because it was a very clear roadmap for them of these are the steps I need to take, regardless of, you know, if they were where if they were falling behind, they, they were able to catch up independently and having that student, that peer community allowed them to move forward without having to, you know, bottleneck their progress of the teacher. Thank you. One one last question to, um, if, if anyone has any other questions. Um, I think Steph put one in chat. I was just going to say, Steph. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I put it in chat. It was supposed to be under Q&A, I guess, right? Um, anyways, my question is, um, there are so many of these subscription ed tech um, products coming to the market, already in the market, and everyone, you have to log into so many different yeah. Um, the products increase. I know you probably get this question all the time. I just wonder if there's any benefit to partnering with an existing um, product to bundle it, to license through there, uh, instead of having another separate product again on the market for yeah. a separate subscription license. How do you deal with that clutter in terms of... Um, totally, yeah. So that's what we were speaking to when we said interoperate with these larger LMSs is we'd like Spindle to live as an app within their LMS system. So the LMS bundles all the little apps within it. Um, and so a lot of schools are on Canvas or Echo or PowerSchool and, and we would just, we would be that missing piece for the project-based learning okay. teachers. Um, yeah, those systems are usually where they do the reporting. And so we would be, that's kind of the summative aspect and we would be the formative assessment aspect, which is like everything that leads up to you being able to do your summative reporting. Okay, that's, yeah, that's super helpful and I miss that. Thank you, uh, Jackie and uh, Christina. Um, if you wanna put your email in the, uh, in the chat uh, and uh, if everyone has any questions, they can reach out to you direct. Um, and and thank, thanks again. I will also mention uh, to the judges, if you have further questions, those who didn't get to ask your questions, feel free to message the panelists directly uh, with any other questions that you have while you're deliberating. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Chris. That was great. Um, oh, anytime. <laughs> um, now we move on to the third company. Um, that's, uh, that's Michael, Michael Riedijk from Lucent Biosciences. Um, Lucent Biosciences is on a mission to address climate impacts on global food security and nutrition with a carbon neutral smart fertilizer called Soleos. Uh, that re it regenerates the soil and deliver higher crop yields without runoff pollution. Um, Michael, the floor is yours. Hi, my name is Michael Riedijk. I'm the CEO of Lucent Biosciences, and we're on a mission to address climate impact on global food security and nutrition by rethinking agricultural fertilizer. When we're talking about fertilizer and agriculture, we typically uh, talk about macronutrients or MPKs. However, plants need more elements to grow. Lucent has been focusing on micronutrients, which is a fast growing new market in the fertilizer industry. <clears throat> the market is growing with 8% rate per year to a $12.5 billion market by 2025. Uh, this growth is driven by soil depletion and uh, population increase. Current micronutrient fertilizer technology was invented in the 1950s and is outdated. It's expensive, it's hard to use, and it's highly pollutant. We've been working on a sustainable replacement for the last six years. We've developed a technology to bind micronutrients in bioavailable state to cellulose and release it on demand to plants. As cellulose source, we're using waste material from the fruit processing industry like rice husk, wheat brands, or lentil hulls. 
the product doesn't leach or and remains inert in the soil until there's biological demand from, from the plants to take up the nutrients on demand. This on demand delivery method is a completely novel approach and we have uh, filed a patent in uh, over 20 nations. In March, we received uh, $1.8 million from the Protein Industries Canada Supercluster to scale up our technology from uh, one kilogram a day in a lab to uh, one ton a day. And uh, over the last year, we built a pilot plan that shows that we're capable of manufacturing this, uh, this product at scale. In addition, we conducted uh, over 32 field trials with eight research partners all across Canada, growing a wide variety of crops, uh, anything from uh, blueberries to grapes to wheat. The results have been truly outstanding. Uh, we have shown that our product uh, can increase yield up to 20% in uh, broad acre crops and up to 40% in uh, vegetables, including an increase in uh, nutrient density up to 50%. Here's some photos of our lettuce trial with our product on the right and a competitive product on the left. Clearly see the difference. Uh, in uh, marigolds with our product on the right and MPK and competitive products on the left. And uh, in corn, and again, on the right, our product, you see the corn cobs significantly bigger than the competitive product. So the value proposition uh, for farmers is really clear. Um, obviously there's higher yields, uh, but also the product's really easy to use. It doesn't smell, doesn't have dust, and it, there's no fine toxicity. The increase in nutrient density in the crops leads to better taste and aroma uh, and a higher quality product. And above all, the product is um, environmental friendly. It's uh, carbon neutral, EDTA free, and doesn't have any runoff pollution. And we found out that it works really well in hard to farm alkaline soils. We want to bring this to uh, the market by licensing our technology to food processors. We want to upcycle their low value byproducts into high value fertilizers that can be sold back to farms that they uh, directly work with. So our uh, technology allows food processors to increase their margin um, from their current low value byproducts that are worth anywhere between zero and $300 per ton to a product that's worth $2,400 a ton with a $600 per ton margin. And uh, we take a royalty in the technology. And at the same time, farmers increase their yield and grow better and higher quality uh, crops. We're looking to scale this up uh, around the globe and get 14 of those plans operational over the next five years uh, in collaboration with the food processing companies and scale up our sales to a, a $60 million uh, revenue, uh, primarily from our license model. We have a strong interest from several uh, fertilizer companies and food processing companies, and uh, we hope to sign the first agreements in the next few months. In addition, we're participating in the Creative Destruction Lab uh, incubator program, and we were a finalist in the uh, Thrive Canada Challenge. For investors, we see a great exit opportunity through either strategic acquisition by one of the fer uh, big fertilizer companies or a buyout by uh, a private equity company focused on agriculture. Uh, we have a very diverse team um, with people you know, with 15 to 20 or over 20 years of experience, including uh, Farah, our um, head of research uh, with 15 years of experience in organic chemistry, Peter Gross, CTO, 20 years of uh, experience in engineering and IP development, Caroline, 20 years of experience in accounting and financial management, uh, Jason, um, over 20 years experience in biotech research and development, and uh, Jose, who uh, has decades of experience in business development. And we're supported by a really great team of advisors, including uh, Neil Brenda of Simon Fraser University, um, Deborah Henderson, uh, director of the Horticulture Institute, uh, Jeff and Chris, who have decades of business development experience in agriculture, and Peter, who has uh, uh, lots of experience in M&A and finance. So we're really looking to make global impact on agriculture literally from the ground up by starting with the soil and helping agriculture transform into a sustainable and circular economy that will produce more and better quality food. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, any, any questions from the, uh, the judges at all? 
Yeah, I got one. Um, so for farmers, um, you know, a lot of times they will do soil analysis to determine what kind of fertilizers they want to use. How different is it going to be using your product since we're talking about micronutrients? How do farmers know which nutrients they need to apply? Is this based on plants, uh, the actual plants you're, you're growing? And, uh, um, and is it possible to over fertilize? Yeah, those are good questions. Um, so the current application of micronutrients in the prairies is, is still fairly limited. It's only 20 to 30 percent of the farms that are actually using it. Typically, uh, depending on the size of the farms, they even ha either have their own agronomy team or they work with distributors that come in and do soil analysis and then advise what type of products are being used. Um, we will be uh, uh, providing initially three product lines, one for iron, one for zinc, and one for manganese. And uh, depending on the soil situation, um, the farmer or the distributor blends it to the specific needs of the farm. That is really not something that we will be doing. What uh, makes our product really unique is um, micronutrients that are existing uh, or in the market right now can be over applied and it can burn or kill your crop. Uh, it requires quite some education and precise application. What we have shown uh, with our product is our product is, um, does not have any form of phytotoxicity, which means that you can apply it, you can even over apply it and uh, the crop doesn't burn, the nutrients remain in the soil and are available for a next season. And I think that is, uh, that is a feature that is uh, fairly unique. Does it answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, and just one last one. Um, I'm guessing that this is not an organic product or wouldn't be compatible with organic farming, um, or maybe it is? It actually is, yes. Um, okay. If we use an organic source of cellulose, then uh, uh, it's an organic product. So we use organic rice husk or organic lentil or pea holes. The end product is an organic uh, product that can be certified. We have spoken with Omri about this already. and. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, if we're using a non-organic source, then it would be a non-organic end product. Indeed. Great, thanks. Yeah. Any other uh, questions from the yeah, judges? I might have missed this uh, in the presentation, but what was um, the increase in yield rate that you found when in the testing? Um, well, it depends a bit on uh, per crop and per region, but we have seen in uh, uh, broad acre crops like uh, canola and wheat and lentils uh, yield increases in the 10 to 15 percent typically. However, in uh, vegetables, we see a, a bigger response. We've seen uh, a yield increase in tomatoes of 27 percent, in lettuce of over 30 percent, and in corn. Um, up to 40%. And uh, trials that we did with blueberries didn't increase the yield, but it increased the product quality. So the, 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 the quality of the berry went from an A to an A plus quality level. Uh, and so the, the, the price per acre or the price per pound basically increased uh, after applying our product. Great, thank you. Any, anyone? I, I can ask something. Um, hi, um, how are you growing um, business contracts right now, licensing, what's, what's the current strategy in terms of? Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a good one. Uh, well, we have a multi-stage approach here. Um, right now we have this um, uh, pilot facility operating in Coquitlam. Uh, we're producing this year about 400 tons. We're doubling it next year to uh, 800 to 1,000 tons of product. That product will be sold directly to farms and through distributors. Uh, I'm just about to close uh, or hire my first uh, director of business development uh, uh, this week uh, to take, take on that challenge. Um, so the first, the first phase really is for us to move our existing production out, um, get it in the hands of farmers. It's direct sales to farms. Um, and uh, setting up these uh, distribution contracts with uh, ag input distributors. Um, the second phase uh, really has to do with um, collaborating with food processors on the manufacturing and scale-up, scale-up manufacturing, uh, bringing it into uh, the hands of the farms that work with those food processors. 
Over the last uh, three weeks, I've been engaged with a series of food processors and uh, I was really surprised with the response. I mean, I, I send out 20 cold emails to CEOs of the biggest food processors here in Canada and um, six of them came back to me immediately. Um, it's a huge problem. They're dealing with this waste stream. They don't know what to do with it. It's going in animal feedstock, it's low value. The idea that that waste stream then can be converted in, into something that has significant value is obviously very, very appealing. In addition to the fact that it, uh, you know, it fits into this whole vision of circular economy and sustainability. Uh, uh, you know, all of those companies are are looking to do uh, you know their thing to uh, to help uh, improve that as well. So it sounds uh, I got some really really good traction and interest. Uh, those are relationships that we need to further develop. Uh, we're starting to look now and talk with their engineering teams. And, but these are processes that will take like, I suppose, like 18 to 24 months or something to close. But the scale up is quite significant because you're going from um, you know, a facility uh, that we have where we're producing, let's say, a thousand tons next year, 800 to a thousand tons next year. You're, you're bumping up to uh, facilities that can do like 25,000 tons or something in a year. Um, so that is sort of the uh, the short term and the longer term uh, strategy. Great. Well, thank you so much, Michael. That was a great presentation. Uh, and thanks to all of our startups today. Uh, our judges are just going to tally their final scores right now. So we'll give them a few minutes to do that. Uh, while we wait, I'm just going to launch a poll um, so I can hear from you guys what your uh, favorite uh, presentation was. So feel free to vote. And if you have any questions uh, from the audience, we can um, go ahead and ask those now. So if you want to type in the Q&A box, go for it. Now is your time. Thanks. So uh, one question came up. Um, where would you would they supply the ingredients for the fertilized compound? Uh, that question's for you, Michael. Yep. Yeah. Michael, sorry, so, Michael. Sorry. No, I mean, like there is, um, you know, agricultural graded uh, inputs that are, you know, generally available. There are large, you know, manufacturers and and producers, and we're, we're just buying it through the existing uh, channels. Uh, yeah, companies like Univar, for instance, and there's there's many others. So it's it's a commodity. It's you know generally available on the, you know in Canada and on the world market in general. And with your current round right now, is uh, where are you at with your, your raise so far? Yeah, so we um, we look to raise, initially we looked to raise $750,000. Uh, we started the end of uh, November and uh, I was surprised that in six weeks we raised uh, over a million dollars. Um, wow. We're now at uh, close to 1.2. Uh, we have decided to, to bump up the round to 1.5. There's a few more other investors also outside of Canada that are uh, currently doing their due diligence. Uh, so I expect that we'll be able to finalize that hopefully by the end of this month. And so, and this, this current round serves actually as a bridge to get to a series A. So we're looking at a series A by the end of this year and uh, using those funds really to expand our trials. So we're doing another 35 large scale field trials this year all across Canada and the United States. Uh, we're you know, scaling up our engineering, our sales and marketing, um, you know, starting to sell the first product into the market. So that's where the funds of this round go to. Okay. Um, question for, for you, Michael, again, uh, yield improvements and non-toxicity confirmed by independent peer review research or have they been? Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we, we've been working with eight different research organizations. We contracted them, actually. Uh, so that includes like Quantum Polytechnic University, UBC, uh, and Guelph University, and other and five other uh, contract research organizations. They conducted uh, these trials independently from us. They're all statistically significant. They collected all the data. And uh, we've trans, you know, translated all that data into uh, reports that are available for our investors to review. All right. Uh, so if there aren't any other questions, it uh, looks like uh, all of our judges are finished with the rate sheet. If you are not, please chime up right now. <laughs> I assume you are, I see numbers, okay. 
Uh, I'm just going to launch this uh, audience favorite poll so we can see uh, what the audience thinks. Okay, here we go. Awesome, thanks for voting on that. Uh, so 51% uh, liked Lucent Biosciences, 33% Stable, and 24% Spindle. Excellent. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to Irene, who is going to announce today's winner. Irene, uh, did you get my message? I, I checked and I got your message, so we're good. <laughs> um, thank you very much, all three of you. I think just because of the fact that you stepped up to, to do this, I think all three of you for sure deserve a prize. So I'm going to start with that. Uh, the winner will move on to, uh, to Whitehorse, but we'll deal with that later. So um, first of all, for um, our uh, sponsors generally, uh, generously have provided prizes for, for all your companies. So I would like to um, hand to Stable virtually. Virtually, we will do that uh, another way soon. Um, two hours of consult and a huge bottle of wine from Harper & Gray. Congratulations that you made it to this uh, Battle of the Pitch Decks. Uh, OKR Finance, also a very loyal sponsor of Vancouver, he has a one hour of consult and they do debt financing that might be quite interesting, plus an Apple gift card. That's for Lucent. So Michael, here you go. We'll take care of that later as well in person. And PwC, um, Ian could not be here, but he kind wanted to make available two hour of a whiteboard session with the big brains of PwC and that's actually quite interesting for Spindle. So Chris and Jackie, here you go. Thank you so much for stepping up and, uh, and being here. So now the big moment, I'm not sure whether I'm the right person to do this, but um, thank you all for being here and the big winner of this first larger version of Battle of the Pitch Decks and who will go on to Whitehorse virtually I think who knows I don't think in June we can travel already so virtually we'll go on Michael Riedijk with Lucent Bioscience so congratulations um, I think we're off <laughs> I think we're off to a very good start uh, of Battle of the Pitch Decks I, I see I have visions of growing this all across the country, but we'll talk about that later. I'm gonna hand it back to you, Tessa, so you can have the final word. It was epic, Jordan, thanks for that. And Tessa, here you go. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Irene and Jordan, uh, Lucent Biosciences, Spindle and Stable, all of our judges, our sponsors, our organizations, and all of you for attending. Uh, so we're going to see you all on March 31st uh, for the White Horse Companies. And that's uh, Start Yukon is the company uh, organizing that. Uh, we're going to witness a battle continue between Substick, Neighborly North, and Discovalo. Uh, and whoever wins that will move on to the finale uh, with Lucent Biosciences. And after that, it's going to be Victoria and then the Okanagan. So please register today on the same Eventbrite link. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Have a great week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Bye-bye.